We are not the enemy of mining. Comrade Renzi said, smiling, puzzled at my frown over dim comprehension. It can be our friend. Multiply the figure of a thousand dollars a day across the thousands of illegal cooking plants and coal mines that lie within Nexality areas. Add to it what top ranking mining companies pay the Maoists each year for protection, an amount described conservatively by Jairam Rameshi as millions and millions of dollars. Mixed into that equa equation non mineral reserves, the hungers of a globalized industry, social grievances, and the Schisms in a developing society caused by ill-distributed coal boom profits and the Nexalities stop looking like museum piece ideological art artifacts and start looking more like an immensely well-funded and complex insurgency that links European economies with a roadside IED planted for a policy big vehicle approaching an Adivasi village in Chhattisgarh. They look like a phenomenon of the globalized present rather than the Maoist past. If the jungle gave the Nexalities a sanctuary and mineral wealth gave them money, it was the land acquisition and displacement that gave them a well of recruits and formed the forefront of the government's response to the insurgency. Ever since it became law in 1894, the Land Acquisition Act, an archaic piece of colonial legislation created expressly to allow the government to seize land for a public purpose under the principle of eminent domain had been the source of bitter contention throughout India. It had displaced millions of people from their homes for mining and hydroelectricity, electricity, road and rail projects. By the time the act was overhauled in 2014 to include meaningful reparation and Rehabilitation clauses for the dispossessed. The damage had been done. In the years since India's independence alone, the rights, the right of eminent domain had been used to displace an estimated 16, 60 million Indians, including about 24 million Adivasis. The hardship has been especially severe for the Adivasis, many of whom have not been properly resettled. Given that 90% of India's coal, more than 50% of mineral reserves, and most of the desirable hydropower dam sites are in Adivasi areas, land acquisition has thus become the de facto fault line between the needs of a traditional hunter-gatherer soci societies and the requirements of a rapidly industrializing economy with a re ravenous uh, appetite for better infrastructure. Yet today, even the new act of 2014 is in different difficulties, originally drafted by Rameshi and passed by the outgoing INC administration, it established a benchmark of a compensation and re resettlement among the displaced, intending to pull the teeth of their anger and undermine the nexalities. Yet under pressure from industry and mining interests, Modi's BJP government is already eyeing the act as the target of a possible revision. 
and lend the right to seem set to remain a source of anger and dispute for the indefinite future. However much they drew strength for, from legitimate social grievances, there was still no adopting the terror the Nexalities could inspire. The brutality of their war revealed itself one spring morning in Chhattisgarh. I had driven deep into the south of the state near the town of Bijapur, following up on a vague, vague policy report about a Maoist attack on an Adivasi village. Stopping in Kutra, Kutru, a village in the foothills of Abzumar, I started out into the press of jungle toward the point where the road, already not much more than a rooted track, finally thinned and divided, pattering out into a half a dozen trails before vanishing into a kale eidoscope of a smashing grain. It may have looked beautiful from the outside, but few Adivasi adults in that forest had a balanced diet and malnutrition was a rife among their children. Anemia and pulmonary tuberculosis were common, and in the more remote areas, infant mortality Morality could take three out of five children. Almost every statistic about the Adivasis placed them at the bottom of India's social scale. They had the lowest life expectancy and literacy rate. Seventy-five percent lived below the official poverty line. Every year, Monsoons brought death to thousands from diseases such as gastroenteritis and mal malaria. Polio and blindness rates were high. The potential benefits of development and a fair distribution of mineral wealth should have brought immense improvements to the quality of life. Had they not been to catastrophic mismanage it. Nine-year-old Marty Talam, whose father was killed in the violence, combs a friend's hair at an orphanage in Kutru, Chariskara. Every child here has lost at least one parent to the insurgency.